and planning. Um, and these are some of the activities as a trustee you may work on during your tenure or you'll need to refer to and understand. Um, so we're, we're going to start with bylaws. When I first started at this role at MBLC, I used to think that bylaws were a very like dry and boring topic. And recently I've become very interested in bylaws because they are the governing document of the board um, and can really help set, set the, um, oh, it's a foundational document of the board. I just may discuss how the board was incorporated, terms of board members, election of officers and duties, meeting frequency, which stipulates a quorum, um, annual responsibilities, removal from the board, how to handle vacancies, what committees there are, how are they formed. Um, and for attracting new board members, this can be a foundational document that discusses how it does its work. So if somebody was, you know, interested in being on the board, this would be one thing to show them to say, here is, you know, this sort of outlines what the responsibilities are, how the work is done. Um, probably we'll talk about the mission as well. Um, it's also going to be really helpful in preventing and resolving conflict and disagreements. So sometimes we hear questions about, oh, how, what, what's, what's the quorum? Um, is it, if you have a board of seven, is it a simple majority of that? But if there's only five current serving members and two vacancies, how is that defined? So by defining that in your bylaws, that will help resolve those issues. Um, and it's a legal document, so it should follow state, local, and federal laws. And it's helpful to, to review this every few years. And there may be a reason why the board isn't following their own bylaws um, and that they should be updated. And we have two resources on bylaws in the virtual trustee packet. So policies. Um, policies are the operational guidelines of the library. So this is going to cover really all aspects of library operations like circulation, customer service, meeting room use, programming, a gift policy, which I think is very important for all libraries to have, um, computer use, lending to libraries that aren't certified, the use of volunteers, study rooms, conflict of interest, search warrants and subpoenas, photography, and more. Um, there is really policies will help um, resolve conflict, uh, uh, be able to explain to people why the library does the work that it does. Um, and again, like bylaws, ongoing policy review is the best policy so that the board can be proactive instead of reactive. And outdated policies can be problematic. So does your collection development policy address VHS but not streaming media or a library of things collection? Does your patron conduct policy include e-cigarettes and vaping or is it written in a way that's broad that may encompass um, new technologies, so to speak? Um, ongoing policy review allows organizations to also continually critically examine how their policies may be unequitable to library users or creating barriers. So one area we see this is around fines and fees. Um, and so some communities have analyzed block cards. So um, if you have fines uh, up to $10 or $25, once some dollar threshold that gets blocked and the user, no, that user no longer has access to library materials. So some libraries have analyzed those block cards, mapped those addresses or zip codes, and found correlations in neighborhoods that were predominantly lower socioeconomic status and or predominantly Black and Latinx. So by removing these barriers, library access increases to members of, in the community. So policies should evolve to meet the library's mission and vision statement, strategic plan, and long run goals. That policy review process is all, all, often a partnership with library staff who carry out that policy and procedures uh, through the daily operations of the library and will make suggestions to the board to review and adapt. Um, before coming to MBLC, I was an assistant director at the Robbins Library in Arlington, so we would be um, uh, department heads, uh, myself and the director would review policy um, and that would get presented to the board to review the suggested changes. Um, they might come back um, and we would look at that at our next department heads meeting. So it was a little bit of an iterative process back and forth. 
There is one policy that uh, libraries are legally required to have, and that is a collection development policy. And this is mandated in um, Chapter 78, Section 33 of the Massachusetts General Laws, um, MGL. So this is for the selection of library materials and use of materials and facilities. And the law also states that library employees um, should not be dismissed for the selection of library materials when the selection is made in good faith in accordance with policy. So comprehensive collection policy is going to include scope and emphasis of the collection, responsibility for selection, collection maintenance, withdrawal and disposal of materials, um, how to handle donated materials and reconsideration of materials as well. So think of this as like a collection life cycle. I think sometimes people get very upset when books are being withdrawn from the library. Um, why? And oftentimes it's for really good reasons. Does it include scientific information that's out of date? Is there um, uh, harmful health information in there? Are there newer editions available? Is the book just in really poor condition and maybe kind of gross and smelly? All really good reasons why a book uh, shouldn't be in the collection. So one um, area as a trustee that's important to be aware of is intellectual freedom. So this is the idea that the rights of library users to read, seek information, and speak freely as guaranteed by the First Amendment. So this is really one of the core values of the library profession, profession and a basic right in our democratic society. And a publicly supported library provides that free, equitable, and confidential access for information for all the people in the community. So as a trustee, we recommend reading or rereading the ALA's Library Bill of Rights, especially where it impacts minors' rights, gender expression, school libraries, economic bar barriers, and more. And this is in the uh, virtual trustee packet. Um, in, the, in the policy, it's also important to think about how challenges will be handled to materials, programs, and displays. So there's the Office of Intellectual Freedom at the American Library Association, which tracks um, material challenges as well as challenges to programs and displays as well. And they, along with some partner organizations, release an annual banned books list, which um, is always out at the last week of September. Um, and I was just looking at it this morning, um, and uh, most of the titles are young adult titles or youth titles with LGBTQI, excuse me, LGBTQIA plus content. Um, and we've also seen uh, increases in um, challenges to programs and displays, even in Massachusetts. So for example, Fall River offered a drag queen story hour in June 2019, which was met with um, challenges and protests. This event was being offered um, during June, during Pride Month, so in, in connection with other events that the community was having around Pride. Um, and this program was supported by the municipal government, um, by the trustees um, as uh, appropriate within the um, programming policy um, that they have. So collection development policy really ensures that all people will be able to seek out information in a variety of form formats and ensuring that the collection isn't formed by one, one just one viewpoint or by political um, pressure. It's really a collection for the entire community. And of course, another resource for this is that our friends at the Massachusetts Library System have a policy collection, which is an incredible resource, kind of a library of policies. So if you need to update or you're looking to add one, this is a great place to start to see examples from a variety of libraries across Massachusetts and the country. So planning. So this is maybe an activity that you'll be engaged in. Um, so this is an opportunity to focus on where you want, where the community wants the library to be in three to five years. What will the library look like in the future and how are you gonna get there? Um, there's four areas, strategic, technology, disaster, and facilities. So I'll just touch on those briefly. Strategic planning um, is one of the bigger undertaking, undertakings that happens every three to five years where the library will review trends, assess future needs, needs 
They'll be engaging with the community and stakeholders to help to develop a plan with goals and objectives. And actually at MBLC, we're involved in this work right now for our own organization. So this, allow, this document will help the library advocate for local funding, um, apply for grants. Um, it can also be used as an opportunity for evaluation and assessment. So I think some examples of strategic planning is maybe looking for the most, re the, excuse me, we're in the midst of census right now. So when that data comes out, we may, may have some new information about who's in our community. So maybe we're seeing an increase of um, immigrants whose primary languages are other than English. Are, are, are your collections able to support those members of your community? So maybe um, wanting to add materials in other languages other than English or adding a staff member. So all of that requires funding. And if that's part of your strategic plan, that's going to help be able to advocate to your municipal stakeholders or look for outside grants to help for some of that. Technology planning. Um, Technology is just like the core of all of our work right now, right? We're all on Zoom, connecting uh, remotely, um, meeting on the internet. So this is, you know, everywhere we look at this, we see how important this is. So this could be included in your strategic planning document. So how is the library supporting the rapid growth of technology in the community and providing access? Um, and technology touches every aspect of library work as well, from the website, computers for the staff and public, security, hardware, networking, everything. Um, also thinking about in your community, and we see this in some of our more rural communities in Massachusetts, um, sometimes out in the western part of the state, um, that the library is one of the only places that offers broadband access. Um, recently read a story about a family that was using the library parking lot to access Wi-Fi. So also thinking about how can the library help advance um, broader broadband goals in the community to make sure that every home is getting internet and that means access to library resources. Disaster planning. This is one area that is also very important and maybe sometimes is overlooked. So these plans address preparedness, response and recovery, and mitigation. It's an opportunity for libraries to engage in planning for the unthinkable, really. Floods and fires, what will be salvaged in the collections and what are the priorities? So some of this might be um, mitigation planning in advance. So um, there are materials, and this is not my area of expertise, so this isn't professional advice to you know, cover materials, um, maybe in the event that when sprinklers go off. Um, and if there, is a, if there is an event like a flood and fire, what collections should be handled first to try to salvage those? Um, we have a consultant on our staff, Evan Knight, our preservation specialist, who can help with starting to think about some of those um, planning for disasters. And there's some easy, um, uh, templates, um, one that's linked in, in our virtual trustee packet that will help you get started on that. Um, it's also kind of planning for the other kind of unthinkable emergencies like violence in the library or health emergencies, uh, a pandemic. So it's to think about um, how the library will support the community during a disaster. Is it providing access to a warm or cool building, ability to charge devices, access to technology and printing? Is it also making your spaces available for emergency services? So for example, in Brookline, while the library building was closed, uh, one of the Brookline fire companies was relocated to that building to reduce um, contact between other companies. This particular building had a kitchen and a shower, so it was able to support um, people living there. Um, but I think it's a great uh, example of how the library was able to support the COVID-19 response um, at such a critical time. And the other, thinking of uh, bathrooms and kitchens and uh, our showers and kitchens and libraries, facilities. So does your current library support and enrich programs for the community? Is it accessible? Is it meeting the needs of staff? Is it efficient? Is it able to support new technologies? So in Massachusetts, we have some beautiful old buildings that are maybe not meeting the needs of um, current, the current needs of library users in 2020. 
they may not be accessible. They may have spirally staircases up to um, stacks. Um, so thinking about who is this library serving? Are we really able to provide access to the collections and all that the library has to offer? So trustees, directors, and staff should be continually engaged in assessment of the buildings. What's the plan for improvement? When do a string of minor repairs lead to major improvements? Um, some communities, these might be part of a municipal capital improvement plan or, uh, or for repairs. So this sort of planning may reveal inadequacies that could lead to a renovation or new construction. So one of the programs at MDLC is our Public Library Construction Program, which is a very competitive grant program, which offers about 40 to 50% of construction, excuse me, construction costs requiring a local match. And just recently in August of 2020, um, Governor Baker signed an act financing the general government infrastructure of the Commonwealth, which included $115 million for the public library construction program. So this money will be used to fund the remaining construction projects on our waiting list um, that were developed during the last construction grant, grant round in 2017. Okay, 